CTSNet, and we are here with CTSNet Global, actually, at the AATS in Los Angeles, and we're highlighting our new platform that is focusing on the disparities in low- and middle-income countries from our colleagues uh, around the world. So we have Dr. Eric Fink here today from Colombia. Well, you're not originally from Colombia. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yes, thank you, Henry. Uh, I'm actually from the Dutch Caribbean. Okay. Uh, from a Dutch dad, and my grandma is Colombian. Okay. And um, when I decided to study medicine, I actually moved to Colombia, did my medical school training there, then my general surgery residency there, and now I'm, I'm doing my cardiac surgery residency. Commitment. <laughs> it's a long way. So you gave a very compelling talk today about the experience of lung transplantation in Colombia, and, and my understanding was you're the first resident who's actually taken part in lung transplantation to a significant extent. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. So uh, lung transplantation began in Colombia 25 years ago. And all the surgeons that initially started their program and, and began transplanting had training uh, abroad. And uh, this included uh, places like Stanford, Pittsburgh, and, and Barcelona. However, during the, the, the years, we had or we still don't have an official lung transplant training program for residents and just because I, I, I wouldn't leave their side I ended up being part of the lung transplant program uh, as a first resident actively uh, in lung transplant in Colombia. And how many transplants have you personally been involved with? Uh, 28. Okay. So quite a few actually. That is quite a few and that's over what period of time? Two years. Okay and so tell us a little bit about the um, the context of lung transplantation in Colombia. You said it started uh, 1997. Right. So we have three centers in, okay. in Colombia, one in Bogota, one in Medellin, and the other one is in Cali. And we have other two centers that um, have performed. However, they're not performing transplants actively. And um, as a matter of fact, they're not performing transplant uh, at this time. So we have three centers. We're the center that perform um, about 12, um, 11 to 12 transplants annually. In Cali, they perform four transplants annually, and in Bogota, they perform six. It's a relatively new procedure um, for the country. 25 years is really not that much. And uh, we perform a total of 153 transplants uh, since then. So it's, it's not a, a high volume procedure. Sure. Sure. So we struggle with the uh, good results with mortality because of low volume and things like that. Sure. Well, you were um, quite transparent uh, about the progress that's been made and the challenges that are obvious in any uh, low to middle income country that we face in healthcare. And when you apply that to something as complex as lung transplantation, we certainly expect a huge uh, learning curve and progress toward uh, outcomes that uh, become more favorable over time. So what do you see as some of the limitations or the challenges that have um, been identified at the beginning that you might have not thought would be problems? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, as a matter of fact, Latin America does not have many lung transplant um, centers. It's a relatively new procedure for Latin America. Brazil and, and Colombia were the ones that are primarily performing lung transplants. And because it's a new procedure, it's a very complex procedure, there's a lot of training involved, um, the entire team getting uh, acquainted to the pathology, dealing with rejection, dealing with graft dysfunction, uh, applying new technologies like ECMO. It's not um, a challenge with regard to resource, but getting used to dealing with this pathology. The other thing is simply centralizing lung transplant. Because if a center performs for a year, you can't expect to have good survival. So one of the things we have to deal with now is making sure we have if we're performing as a country 21 lung transplants a year the idea or ideally would be performing all of these transplants in one center sure and um, is there a unified sort of organ procurement system or it's just in an individual list at each institution for uh, patients on the lung transplant list okay so for for kidneys for liver and for heart transplant, we have a national uh, pool, we have a national list. And um, if a patient uh, needs an emergent transplant, then we'll get that organ to that city, independent of where it's uh, procured. With lung transplant, with lung grafts, we, st we still don't have that system. So all the lungs remain in the city of procurement. 
um, but we're trying to get that also on a national um, level to make sure that a patient in another city might need uh, might get that lung. Why do you think the lung transplant program lags behind the other transplant programs just because of its um, newly formed attention to the program, or what do you think? Yes, I think that when you want to establish a lung transplant program, it would the best um, idea would be to establish it in a place that's already used to other transplants, like heart transplants, um, kidney transplants. But there are few centers performing heart transplants in Colombia. We only have eight centers performing heart transplants, and these would be the ideal centers to introduce lung transplants. So you want to have a, a team that's ready to face um, all it has to do with lung transplants. And the idea would be to have a, a team that's, that is interested in that. Sure. And um, along with uh, talking about you know different centers in different locations, you mentioned that the mountainous terrain in Colombia is a uh, barrier in some ways to which part of the process? Yeah, so when we procure the lungs, uh, ideally we would like the ideal patient to get these lungs. So whether it's in one city or, or another, but because of the mountainous regions, we have mountains all over the place. So getting from one city to another, uh, it might not be that far away, but getting across a mountain or through tunnels, it takes uh, anywhere from six to eight hours. So it's not ideal for intercity um, transplantation. So what we're trying to do is getting an air bridging system um, to get our lungs um, from city to city, um, but that also has its challenges. And um, what are the what would it look like? So you get a call for an organ that's available from a gunshot wound, which was your most common cause of donor right. um, availability. What, how does that that action get set in motion? What are the steps? So. Uh, we have a, a transplant team that's uh, established by the Ministry of Health okay. that is called up if any patient becomes a donor. So the moment a patient comes into the ICU of any hospital um, and they're bring the, they're notified. Uh, the transplant team are notified and when the organs are confirmed that the patient has uh, organs to donate, uh, they would call all the centers up. We're called for lung transplants and for heart transplants. And other centers are called for the kidneys and pancreas and, and the livers. And then uh, we'll go to that hospital, see the patient, procure the organs, and everyone would just harvest their, the organs needed. Sure. Okay. And, um, you know, we're talking about very complex um, procedures and multidisciplinary care, right, of these patients. I think something that put it in context for me was hearing you talk about the lack of availability of, for instance, a preoperative bronchoscopy right. on your donor or a preoperative echo. And so getting the, the uh, donations back to your hospital and finding out on the bench that, what did you find a tooth in the bronchus? Yeah, or... we found two teeth in our, <laughs> our, in our last lung transplant. We found two teeth in the left main bronchus uh -huh. because of a gunshot wound to the oral cavity. Okay. Yeah. And what other surprises have you found uh, with your with your organs? Uh, last year, we found a, a heart with a dysfunctional valve, uh, bicuspid, stenotic, and very badly calcified valve. So we had to uh, perform an AVR on the bench um, because we had the patient, the, the recipient, on the bench with an empty chest. So the only way to save that patient was to change the valve before implanting it. So we had that case. Uh, as a matter of fact, a week ago, we went to get an organ, uh, procure a heart from a 35-year-old um, victim. And when we opened up the chest, it was completely dilated, and the patient had no clinical history of, of cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. So obviously, we had to uh, wake up our recipient back at the clinic mm -hmm. from his anesthesia and, and give him the bad news that the heart didn't, didn't uh, work for him. So some of the things that we have to deal with. So it would seem to me that if you're doing heart transplant in the country, that um, transesophageal echo must be part of that process of obtaining an organ for donation in respect to the heart. So why do you think it's not possible to apply that to your lung transplantation protocols? Well, because most of our, our hospitals that we procure organs from are peripheral, low-funded public hospitals that do not have many much resources. So uh, they don't have echoes, they don't have immediate bronchoscopies, and we try to get the organs as fast as possible. 
because of the lack of experience of those hospitals and maintaining the organs viable. So we do our best to get, get in and get out as, as quickly as possible, but that means without all the studies necessary sometimes. Sure. And how do you maintain the organs as you're traveling to your site for implantation? We just use cold saline, ice, and jugs. And just <laughs> okay. get them in our van and, and, and head straight for our transplant center. Sometimes all the fancy things aren't all that they're made up to be, I guess. Okay. Exactly. And we, uh, we still don't have ex vivo in, uh, in Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh, we have just placed our first LVAD. Um, a couple of months ago at our clinic, so it's we're right in the middle of, of, of innovation at this point. So we, we're lagging uh, behind the United States and Europe a couple of years, but um, it's fun. Sounds like an exciting, pivotal time, though, isn't it? It's fun. It's fun, yeah. It was great for you to um, to share your experience. I just wanted to uh, to ask a, a medical student who was there with you recently, Kevin Generis. Would you like to uh, just? Come and chat with us for a second. So you just spent, you're from Indiana University, you just spent some time um, with Dr. Vink in Colombia. What was your impression um, based on your uh, observation and experience there in Colombia? Oh, well, I had the opportunity to work with uh, the surgeons at Clinica Cardiovid, and it was great to see the high volume center and how they really ahead on technology of a lot of centers that have a similar uh, income level in that country. And so um, I thought it was extremely interesting how they've been really innovative and how the technical skill is really uh, advanced. I think. And it was great to learn from them and see how they're doing everything. Wonderful. Thank you. So it sounds like uh, you were being mentored by the future of lung transplantation in Colombia, right? When do you complete your training and what would be the next steps for you? So uh, I'll actually be um, finalizing my residency in about a year. Okay. And uh, I did uh, a general surgery training, then a three-year cardiac surgery fellowship. So I'll be done in, in a year. And hopefully I could do something about that. Since I'm not originally from Colombia, uh, I might be returning to my home country or not. Uh, and my home country of, of Aruba also has also other challenges. Sure. Because they don't have cardiac surgery and all their patients are sent to Colombia for cardiac surgery. <laughs> So, wow. so that's another that's another story. So there are a lot of open doors mm -hmm. and uh, and options to look into. Well, we and look forward to following your pathway. We'll have to meet back here in a few years and to hear how it all unfolded. But thanks for your great work and for sharing it today at AETS and for us at CTS Net. Thank you very much. <laughs>